introduce the final invited speaker for today, Dr. Danny Singh. Uh, professor Singh is an associate professor and the director of graduate education in plant breeding at Iowa State University. He earned his PhD from the University of Guelph in 2007, where he then worked as a wheat breeder in agriculture and agri-food Canada prior to joining ISU in 2013. He has developed 36 varieties for commercial production and 13 germplasm lines. This is in wheat. Um, these commercial cultivars were grown in about 6.2 million acres in 2017, attesting to their adoption by farmers. As a soybean breeder, his team's primary focus is to develop conventional and food grade varieties for Iowa farmers. His research interests are in phenomics, genomics, robotics, and artificial intelligence, and their deployment and breeding applications. He has so far published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers. Thank you, Danny. It's good to see uh, a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. It's uh, exciting to see the the conference that you folks have put together. Uh, those of you, I see Julie here, I see Carolyn, those of you uh, who have put the P3 program together, I congratulate you. I think the P3 uh, program uh, with the leadership you folks have shown and then the leadership students are showing, it's really uh, setting up Iowa State for great success, if not already. Uh, we have uh, some amazing things that are happening on campus in a very collaborative manner. And I'm going to try and uh, capture some of those activities or projects that we have uh, ongoing. At any time, if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to ask. I wanna, it's going to be difficult to uh, you know, use one of the screens, but uh, what I'm presenting today, it's uh, not just my work. I'm presenting on behalf of a team of very creative uh, researchers. So if you can, uh, if you're on Twitter, you may search for us in their Soinomics. We decided that you know people have genomics and people have phenomics, so we're going to have soynomics. So that's who we uh, would be seen on Twitter. And when uh, I was asked for a title, it's different than what uh, was put on the brochure. I apologize for it. Uh, those of you who work with me, you know that I'm brilliantly late for almost every deadline. So uh, I thank uh, Clayton to put that title together. But uh, when he re-asked me, I had a different title because uh, you know, when John, you were introducing me, you were using with robotics and artificial intelligence and those things. So it's, uh, it's, I'm trying to reinvent myself as a plant breeder. These are, you know, topics that I didn't learn uh, as a graduate student, as a plant breeder, but these are topics that fascinate me and I think it helps our team to deliver on the objectives, the funding agencies, uh, you know, requirement from us to uh, do things more creatively. So I'm gonna try and uh, get through a few of those examples in the slide today. Slides today. Most of you, I would assume, have a plant breeding uh, background, at least some uh, understanding of plant breeding, uh, what plant breeding is. So uh, for a plant breeder, just briefly, I want to make sure that I convey, communicate to you that for a plant breeder, what we are most interested in is a product development. And that product is a cultivar that is to be grown by farmers. And when farmers are growing uh, that particular cultivar, it has to have the characteristics that would meet the need of other uh, stakeholders, whether they are processors and also us as consumers. In order to develop this product, there's a you know, series of steps that we go through. There are lots of disciplines that are uh, integral for plant breeding to exist. So plant breeding, yes, you know, we put it as, you know, discipline of plant breeding. But uh, if you really think of plant breeding, you know, as a domain uh, uh, subject, plant breeding can only exist with the integration of a lot of, you know, these disciplines that I've listed. Traditionally, it was more uh, plant science uh, based. So we would have agronomy, physiology, molecular biology, biotechnology, you know, all those uh, disciplines. But over time, plant breeding is evolving just like other subjects. And it is getting a, a huge infusion of things in mathematics and statistics and operations research, and then in, in you know, engineering. So P3, as I said, you know, it kind of defines um, you know, some of the things I'm talking about. So maybe um, you know, plant breeding equates to P3. I don't know. To me, it seems like it does. 
But every so often, um, and all of you will probably go through it, some of my you know, colleagues may have gone through this themselves, every so often we, uh, we feel motivated to reinvent ourselves. We may be successful, but maybe that's not enough for us. Maybe we are not successful, and then we require to do something different. And the motivation for me to get into what I'm doing with you know, a very uh, creative team comes from these uh, five aspects that I've put together. I've put what was happening in the past, and then where we foresee us to be in the future. So this is myself five years ago. You know, we did have good success. You know, John uh, mentioned those numbers for a plant breeding, uh, for any plant breeder, they, you know, there are numbers that you feel that, okay, you know, what uh, you're most passionate about, you know, you are able to contribute in some uh, meaningful manner to the society. But, you know, as I say to uh, students, we just talking about it, I'm just unintelligent enough to not realize what cannot be done. So what that means is, you know, you know, along with these creative minds uh, who are in the room and my collaborators, we just continue doing unintelligent things, not realizing that some things are not meant to be touched, but we said, no, let's, let's take a look at it. So first one is collaboration. In the past, you know, the success could be defined and I could take the claim for that success. But that's not, uh, I don't think that's uh, needed and I don't think that's right. I explained to you in the previous slide that plant breeding is you know, an integrative science. It brings a lot of people together. So not only is it about collaboration, it goes beyond that. It goes to the realm of shared vision and leadership. What I mean by that is what we are doing, so this is a, a photograph of our, of our group. It just kind of you know, laid nicely when I was taking a look at it. It worked out nicely because we have, starting from our planter to our combine and in between our you know, these drones and sensors. When we were taking this picture, we didn't see it that way, but it actually turned out from planting all the way to harvest. What we are attempting to do in our group is that it's not just my vision of what we want to uh, you know, work on or what we want to do. What we try to do is we come collectively to come up with a shared vision, a collective buy-in in in what we want to do. And that's, you know, it's a work in progress, but I think we are making, you know, some uh, headway in getting to that shared vision and leadership. I want to uh, bring these three collaborators of mine, Dr. Sarkar, Dr. Ardi, and Dr. Bhaskar. Dr. Sarkar and Dr. Bhaskar, most of you may know, uh, they're in College of Engineering. Dr. Ardi is uh, in uh, Agriculture and Life Sciences. These three colleagues are uh, integral to what I'm doing or what my students are doing. I'm very thankful for the collaboration we have. The three of them bring very different backgrounds and expertise and how they approach a problem. And what that means is that it's not just one person making decision on how we approach, how we define a problem and how we approach it, but we actually can come from a very diverse you know, mindset to come together in a shared vision and leadership. So I'm very thankful to them and, and their group. So I've talked a little bit about, uh, you know how to do that? A little bit about uh, collaboration. The next aspect that I thought in the past, about five years ago, that needed to be done in the future is the aspect of automation, where we had very little automation in the past. And the plant building pipeline, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of data points. You can imagine when we go to that scale, automation, you know, it's just necessary. You know, it's not a nice to have, it's, it's something that is really needed. We recently uh, uh, published, I keep pressing this because uh, my pointer has the, uh, we recently published this uh, paper uh, that talks about uh, an automated phenotyping uh, system where there is a, a layered sensing in the sense uh, we are trying to get different robots and to communicate with each other. So there is a saliency driven phenotyping. Either we can have an approach of, you know, robots can go and they can collect this information, or we can try and have a task partitioning where different robots have different uh, tasks. So what we achieve is that there's no missed data point. 
So based on what, is, what we need to collect in terms of phenotype, this conference is all about phenotyping. As a breeder, phenotyping is most dear to me. And there are multiple ways of approaching phenotyping. We need to make sure that we are phenotyping at the scale that it is needed, with the resolution that is needed, and in the time uh, sensitivity that it is needed. And that's where these ground-based robots, they still have a role because they can provide good resolution and uh, ability to uh, get phenotype on certain organs that can be missed in an aerial platform. So with this approach, um, we can see that you know, it's a simple robot that has the GPS and it has its, you know, it's automated so it can go around and it can collect uh, phenotypic information. So there are aspects, and along with the, uh, the drone, this is from a recent uh, picture, Kyle, Kevin, Matt, that's Artie, and that's our favorite Sai, and that's Brian. I think Matt is in the audience. I don't know if anyone else is. Oh, John is, but they're not in the picture uh, in this one. I, I missed out too, John. We, you know, I don't know where you and I and others were, but we missed out. But this uh, is the kind of phenotyping I'm talking about. You're working at a, at a very uh, base where we can collect high resolution in an automated manner that humans do not have to go and collect you know, these difficult to measure traits. It's done using a robot. I'll come to the aspect of the, uh, the trait collection later, but this is just talking about we can get the information and then we can use for other traits much faster, but coming at a little lower resolution. So this, I talk about collaboration. I've given you an example of the kind of automation that is happening uh, in the phenotyping space. So collecting uh, you know, phenotypic information, that's really, really good. And myself, along with you know, making my, uh, my students guilty with me, we have been guilty that we have collected a lot of information. And then once we have collected all the information, we say, okay, now how do we you know, challenge or you know, tackle this, this you know, tremendous amount of data? And there have been um, lots of uh, very rapid innovations that have happened in this space in terms of the ability of the machines to be able to do these repetitive tasks to determine or to uh, able to extract phenotypic information that would have been either uh, not possible previously, uh, not at the scale, uh, or you know, the ability to collect you know, the, the dimensionality of uh, whatever we are trying to, uh, to uh, get recognize. So in this uh, review article, which came two years after our first article, so in 2016, Ardi and uh, the three of us, we published um, a review article on machine learning. We thought, yeah, this is amazing. Two years later, yes, it's amazing, but it's kind of obsolete because the, the advancement of the, uh, the statistical learning, it's moving at such a rapid pace that now we're talking about deep learning. And the difference uh, in this paper, if you are interested in these kinds of things, I would encourage you. Uh, it's not exhaustive, but hopefully it gets you, you know, some ideas for your own uh, research endeavors. The difference between um, machine learning or deep learning is that there is feature engineering that is happening in the machine learning. So uh, as humans, we are still involved in either annotating or labeling information. And then you know, we uh, get the program. So we have the input, we have the output and we can figure out the program because we have provided the labels. And if they're images, it means some expert has to spend countless hours to you know, say that, okay, this is disease X or Y and so on. Deep learning, it removes that aspect because humans can be very good, but they still have issues of the variability in what they're seeing and what they're you know, um, annotating. With deep learning, you remove that bias, inherent bias that we all have, so you're able to get a model that can use, but it requires a lot more data, but you can get um, the rec if you're interested in so the phenotyping, it can automatically be done. And that's what this paper talks about. And so if you think of, uh, I'll, I'll explain what is happening here in the next slide with the, the feature extraction, but here is handcrafting of features and here it's automated. You're not providing labels. The program is learning itself and using that learning to come up with the output. The, uh, uh, the pipeline for this is, you know, you have your data that you're gathering, uh, data curation, which is, you know, very, very important. And then you have your training and validation uh, that is happening. 
And there are different things you have to be very careful that you're not overfitting the model. So you may have uh, K-fold validation and you know, plenty of data and all those things. But with the training and validation, you, we also have to have, so you're uh, tuning your hyperparameters to continuously improve your model. And once you think you have a good model, you test it with unseen data, and if your model is good, then you can, you're ready to deploy it. This is where, so this is hard, because you have to collect good data. Just data is, you know, uh, we have talked about this, you know, that sometimes bad data is uh, worse than no data. So you have to have good data, and that's where those of us who are in plant sciences come into the picture, that we provide good data to our, you know, computational scientists. This is where, this is the tough part, to be able to get to a program that is doing the job, it is accurate. Deployment is not as difficult, you know, the deployment phase is not as difficult. Talking about the third aspect of what was motivating us, the, the sensing variability, the amount of work that goes in, and the human's ability to, to phenotype. So remember I said that you know, in a given year, we may be phenotyping close to a million different individual plants. So that's a tough task, you know, it's not easy. So we need to be able to come up with models that can uh, do the job for us, but we are comfortable and we agree that the job they're doing is in fact valid, it is true. So that aspect of that machine learning or the deep learning, so deep learning is great, but what was missing in the deep learning approach was, we did not know what did the computer learn. We know that it does a very good job if you feed in a bunch of these images of let's say 10 different diseases, it can learn to quantify how much stress is in those images automatically. It can tell us with a very high level of uh, accuracy that it is this disease and it also has 70% severity. But it, we do not know that what exactly did the model learn. So as human beings, whenever we cannot answer something, and Jianming and I have joked about this, that whenever we don't have an answer, we say it's G by E. That's our, you know, our standard, or you know, it's very quantitative. And yes, you know, um, that's good, but we are still motivated. That's why you know, Dr. Yu or myself and others, we do the research we do because we can get from input to the output. But what bothers us as human beings is if we do not know why. And that's the whole point of why, you know, what we do as researchers. So the, the aspect of explainability is so critical that gives the users confidence uh, in the model. And that's what this particular paper that uh, came out, and where is David? David uh, Blystone and Sam Goschel, they work very closely together. They are first authors on this. Uh, this particular paper, if you haven't read it, I, you know, I would encourage it. Uh, actually, uh, you know, it's something that every time I read it, I learn something else, uh, you know, although I'm a co-author, because it's quite deep that you know, it, it covers a lot of different aspects of deep learning. What this uh, is explaining here, so there is a, a DC deep convolution neural network architecture uh, that's happening. Uh, up here, but then this is the explainability aspect where uh, you're interested in being able to identify which particular stress you have. From a plant breeding perspective, you're interested in giving it classes, resistant, moderately resistant, moderately susceptible, susceptible. So that's the classification. So, you know, then quantification is how much stress in a percentage from zero to 100, and then being able to um, predict, which we're not you know, talking about here, but from these, and I apologize, these are smaller, um, you probably can't see it, but what's happening here are there are symptoms of different diseases, and this is what, with the feature map that the deep learning architecture was using, with the activation function, with the threshold that was used that, you know, assuming it's a Gaussian, the activation map is a Gaussian distribution, three standard deviation is the threshold. If it's, you know, beyond it, you're gonna keep it. This is what the, the algorithm learned, are these red, you know, these regions that you see, the red regions that you're seeing, those are the disease region on the leaves. So the computer came back and is saying, you know, the learning is saying, this is what I used to define the, you know, what I'm quantifying. 
This is what I learned. And as human beings, when we are asked to describe something, you know, if it's this, you know, we'll say, well, it's about, you know, 15% and it's the color. Like we gravitate towards the, uh, the color maps to some extent. And that is one of the things that the machine is also looking at. It's looking at, you know, its position, but it's also looking at the gradient in the color difference to say, okay, you know, this is what I'm using to come up with, you know. So now it gives us confidence that, you know what? Yeah, okay, and you're giving me some explanation. What do we need to do next? We need to test it ourselves. This, on this side, this is potassium deficiency symptom. These are very um, symptomatic of potassium deficiency. The, the tips are yellow, and this is for sudden death syndrome. So what this is showing is that humans, when, so humans were not involved in development of the model, but after, to test it, humans went in and marked the image the experts, not just any human, expert went to mark the image to see how close were they in describing or you know, identifying that particular stress. What you can see is humans are quite coarse compared to the computer because computers, they do not have, uh, they can get to a much finer grain of, uh, of separation than humans can. You know, when we mark, we just don't have the ability. That's why we have automation. That's why we had the industrial revolution and then continuously automation. There are aspects that we're just not good if we have lots of them to do. So this is explaining that work to uh, show that computer, this is in fact what the disease symptoms were, but humans, when we mark, you know, we would mark it up. So this is not solved the, all the problems. By no means am I saying that. This is an iterative process. It will continue to get better and better. But what I'm saying is that eventually we may get to a stage where phenotyping with those drones or robots along with the algorithms you know, that we just talked about, we may get the phenotypic information that feeds in into our you know, quantitative genetic models where we actually have more accurate and more precise phenotype to be fed in into the model. Sometimes we miss out on discoveries because maybe we do not have the granular scale that is needed for that phenotype. Other questions so far? Okay, I'm gonna uh, shift gears a little bit here. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about um, the difficult traits and then the research. I wanna clarify, you know, research is, you know, quite a big, you know, it encompasses everything. With research, the motivation was that up until past, as a plant breeder or a researcher, I was more interested in deductive reasoning where there are some rules and I could test my observations to see if they fit those rules, yes or no, and move forward. My motivation as an evolving scientist is how can I have a little bit more of inductive reasoning because I just told you that we have a lot of data, we're increasing our capability to analyze that data, how can we work with a lot of information to identify some patterns from this huge set of observation, identify patterns to help set up new set of rules that can then be tested to see that, yeah, they fit. And then you have looping it back into deductive reasoning. So you see how inductive and deductive reasoning are gonna follow each other. You know, so I'm interested that with all the huge amount of data that we are collecting, can we come up with uh, new information, new patterns, uh, that can help us set up some new rules, some, you know, some generalization of new rules. The difficult traits aspect is in the past, if someone asked me to, would you be interested in working on roots? And I say this and you've heard me say it, I'd say, no, I don't want to work on roots. That's a carrier killer. And if it was working on roots, the only thing I would measure, maybe two things. Maybe I can measure the length and the biomass. That's all I want to measure because it's so difficult. Can you imagine? So I generally follow this rule and my students may not know this, but I do follow it, that I do not give a project to them that I would not have taken if I was a graduate student. And I would not appreciate if my major professor would say that, okay, we have, I don't know, 10,000 root samples and you have to measure every single, you know, detail from it painstakingly with, you know, all those things. So it's so difficult, but these are 
critical questions that need to be answered. So I'm not saying that the need of science is not there. It's definitely there, but how can we, uh, how can we leverage some of the things that are happening to help us accomplish those tasks? So with the moving into try and get into those difficult traits and then the inductive and deductive reasoning, uh, this work is uh, Kyle Parmley's. Uh, Kyle Parmley is a PhD student and is now a Bayer employee as of this week. So he's probably in Chesterfield making some placement decisions uh, for his new employer. So Kyle was interested in uh, coming up with prescriptive cultivars. And the concept there is that how can we develop cultivars in a way that we know what would be the best fit for them in farmer's field. If we knew the farmer, what uh, management system the farmer is using, can we place, can we develop the genetic material and place it accordingly? Because farmers, they have different agronomic systems that they follow. What we do in plant breeding is we follow one system of testing, and then at the end of testing, when the product is developed, we say, okay, does it, you know, um, it's probably good for you. Yeah, your management system may be different, but we have done, you know, hundreds of location testing, this is good. Yes, it may be, but can we be a little more strategic? And that's what dri was driving Kyle's question that farmers are thinking, always thinking of, you know, um, their uh, resources, the management system they have, weather. So that's another uh, thing I've probably heard me say. If you ever ask me about weather, I'll never say it's good. I'll always find some fault with weather. I'm never satisfied, always be better. And maybe I took it because I hang out with farmers a lot. And that's one thing that, you know, Matt, would you agree? Other people that, you know, who farm actively, you know, there's always something that could be better in farming. But weather is a big component um, for farmers. And it's for plant breeders as well. Farmers are thinking how can they improve their profitability. And what we are thinking is that how can we develop the genetics? Kyle and I, and along with our collaborators, we are attempting to bridge this. How can we equate the genetics we develop with the profitability that farmer is going to make? It's motivated with a bunch of different agronomics, their different environments, and there is different germplasm. With our ability to test different traits, we can tune our germplasm to fill in the phenomic cube as much as possible. If we can fill in the phenomic cube as much as possible, we can determine or we can predict the performance of different genotypes in those different agro-management systems. So rather than build a product and then determine it, build a product by keeping this in mind. And this is a slide that Kyle has put together in you know, his evolution of how you know, he got to this stage where uh, when we started, this is a spectral radiometer, a backpack. They need to have strong shoulders and back, but you can get a lot of good information uh, from it based on plant, for plant health. But Kyle is very innovative. So he uh, said that, you know, yeah, Danny wants me to get all these imaging done. You know, he went back to his farm and he, you know, thought of the design and now he can, he put four cameras so he can do 4X of what he was doing alone. This was version one, then we did version two, okay? John, you're shaking your head with something. Uh, so this 2015-16 uh, uh, was version one of the, of the model. What we could do with the information that Carl was collecting, just with the images, if you asked me to get information on branch angle and internode and you know, branch number and you know, the convex cell for the shape, it's very difficult. So essential because these are component traits that are forming in into that final yield, but so difficult to, to collect. But with the advances in, um, you know, the analytics that I was talking about, we can get that information with these kinds of imaging systems. We moved to aerial platforms where this is an example of a very, uh, in my opinion, quite creative uh, feel where Kyle is looking at two different row spacing treatments. So this is a factorial design where he has 32 different genotypes across several locations that are planted. This could not have been done without a GPS-enabled planter, but because of the GPS-enabled planter, we could put this test together. 
and then using aerial uh, phenotyping, we could uh, collect information at the, same, at the same time compared to this because you start on plot one, by the time you're done, it's eight hours later. So we get rid of that problem. And the attempt here is that, you know, how can we get all the information that exists in above ground and eventually with connecting it with below ground, which I'll come to towards the end of the presentation. So combination of machine learning and intelligent phenotyping in a time sensitive manner, the large scale across different environments, we can now parse out the predictors of, for these genotypes, the predictors for individual management systems. Now we do not need to test them in those eel trials. We can predict to some reasonable level of confidence. Of course, we can always get better. Some level of confidence that this genotype that's in the field in these short rows, we predict that it will be a better fit in a narrower row uh, spacing or a wider spacing. So that's you know, one of those difficult phenotype traits. But now we are at a stage that you know, we can keep working towards getting it you know, further and further uh, refined to get into uh, you know, those agro-management systems. So this is uh, John over, over here. So John uh, came in and uh, John loves to work with data. I got to hand it to him. Uh, you know, those of you who have, you know, hang out with him, you know that he's very passionate about, you know, data sciences. He spends a lot of time. And one of the things that he picked up as one of his projects, this is not his only project, but the project that uh, he picked up is how do we combine the genetic information, the weather information to be able to predict yield. And thankfully in the soybean community, we have, um, a publicly accessible database that goes decades, back decades, but John was able to convert a lot of that information that existed on pages into you know, digital format. And you were using about 15 years of, uh, of uh, data across close to 100 different locations, 170. And they span the entire uh, you know, continental US where soybean is grown north, south, east, west, wherever soybean is grown. And these are public trials. So we do have information on which genotypes they were, their pedigree, and then from the nearest weather station, the weather, the, uh, the weather information for those locations throughout its life cycle. The interest here is that can we utilize two things? Can we come up with a prediction of how the location is going to behave? And that's motivated by our intent that plant breeding is about 10 year cycle, generally from the time you make your first hybridization to when it will make it to a farmers. And if you're um, better resource, uh, if you have more resources, it can be maybe a six or seven year. But we gotta be thinking that how would our efforts now feed in into what are some of the climate tech scenarios in 2025, 2030. So the interest is, can we predict the performance of different locations to see which location is behaving like Iowa would in those 15, 20 years. If we have that ability, then we can start testing our material and developing a material you know, in those locations. So that's you know, one of the motivation that John has. The other one is that, can we come up with better prediction of the genotype itself with the combination of weather variables and its pedigree? We do not have SNP information on these. So we're working you know, without all of that information, but can we come up with better prediction? So the, uh, the archive paper is you know, accessible. We're working on you know, some additional things. Of course, the archive paper generally is not full uh, to combine those two aspects. And this um, graph here is showing the success that uh, we are achieving and this is in a test set. This was not ever uh, included in the development of the model. The model that John uh, has used is uh, long short-term memory. It's uh, a good machine learning model. That's something, uh, another thing I've learned is uh, ML doesn't, no one ML model is solution for everything. You have to look at you know, specific problem, the kind of information you're feeding in 
to pick which model will work. So there's some kind of you know, art in that as well. So with this information, using the entire growing season, came up with a model. And that's using uh, soil temp uh, air temperature, uh, precipitation, um, day, uh, night, uh, day uh, temperature, a bunch, there were eight different variables. In this testing, you can see that the, the red, so blue, uh, the black is the prediction, and this is real, the red. And you can see that across these different untested environments, we're getting pretty reasonable overlap in most cases where what we are predicting that this is what the performance of that location is, you know, it is matching in that untested. And again, this is a work in progress, but imagine just with the weather variables, we can come up with some reasonable level of prediction. Imagine what can happen when we start adding, you know, more complex uh, phenomena, whether it's coming from the weather or from the genetics. This is John uh, being quite happy because he finally got another uh, toy. So that's something we joke about as we're setting up our projects that, you know, how can we get some toys that we can play with? So we are integrating our own weather station. So every test that we are putting in, our attempt is that we are gonna have our own weather station. We're not gonna rely on you know, airport data that may be 20 miles, or I was almost gonna say kilometers there at Clayton, I checked myself, um, that may be 20 miles. And this feeds in into you know, that intent that not just public data, but from our own data, that we are able to come up with those predictions and also including our genomic information as we move forward. In 2016, this was uh, our vision where, you know, whether it's a farmer or a breeder, he or she has a capability of these ground robots and aerial robots. And last, or this year, we got to a stage where, um, If it's going to work, maybe it won't. So there's a video here. And in the video, you can, what it would show is that these are ground robots that I explained earlier. This is the uh, version two of that phenotyping card, the push card, which um, meets some of the other uh, requirements that we learned. This is that breeder. And this is the drone. So what we were envisioning two years ago, we're finally being able to realize to come to a stage where we can phenotype at what we thought is needed to make some of the advances that we need for our genetic research and then for plant breeding. This video here was a video where it's kind of cool because when the video goes with the robot, it looks like they're a bunch of trees and they're soybean plants. But again, the video can capture with the video frame, you can actually isolate the organs that you're interested in. And there's some supervised learning that is going on at this stage. Hopefully we'll make it completely unsupervised, but you can get that organ information on a bunch of uh, different genotypes that was not possible five years ago. You know. This is Matt and um, Matt is our official uh, drone person. Uh, Matt taught himself how to operate drones and he's managing a fleet of three drones now. And this is uh, Matt that, who's flying uh, the drone here, and they're, we're collecting uh, trade data, at the, so ground truth data. And this is the drone that's you know, getting information. Um, again, with the intent that how do we fuse these different layers of uh, information to come up with the, uh, the optimal uh, uh, phenotyping information. One of the questions that Matt has an interest in is to look at you know, the spatial, the, the resolution uh, question at for the uh, traits of interest, you know, what kind of resolution do we need and what time of time series do we need to get that information? So we don't have any, so we plug in any holes in that phenotyping platform. We are able to get the information we need in the time that we need and in the resolution that we need. And we can use that information uh, 
to fit in into our spatial adjustments because again, we want to reduce our variability. So we want to be working you know, with as precise, as accurate a data. So this is a time series of a particular trade that we have an interest in. This is the rating scale. So we can get a time series, um, you know, genome-wide association study or other studies that can happen, you know, with this information. It brings me to a slide that Clayton always puts, and he asked me, you know, how many nodules are there? And I couldn't, I didn't know, but there are 34. He's, he's told me that. But Clayton's interested uh, the aspect I told earlier. Root is something I didn't feel, you know, comfortable, confident, but, you know, kudos to Clayton and Kevin who have really, you know, have taken it and they're running with it. This is something that I don't think I could have, you know, even thought of doing myself. So I appreciate uh, Clayton and Kevin to really, you know, put their teeth into this. What is happening here is we have an interest in being able to study. So we are trying to get our genetics to be as optimal as possible and not wasting its resources. And one of those aspects in soybean, because it fixes, you know, atmospheric nitrogen, is being able to study nodulation, time series of nodulation study, so we can determine what variability exists, and then we can maximize our response for the nodulation aspect, because if it's wasteful, we don't need it. So this is what is motivating, but when you have motivation, not necessarily do you have the tools to go with it. So Clayton worked tirelessly to come up with a solution that he calls SNAP, which is uh, very creative. And that's Clayton talking. So uh, in this, uh, this is using a, a faster uh, region RCN, uh, CNN. In this one, there are patches of images. So Clayton has annotated, has put labels where the nodules are. So with these patches, then the model comes, puts the patches back together and gives uh, some level of confidence for each of the nodule that it detects. So it's learned what is a nodule because Clayton has supervised it and given it the information. And then that information is being used to come up with above ground what is happening and then you know what is happening below ground on a bunch of different genotypes in a time series. And he's using that information to fill in the, the knowledge gap because we don't really have you know, good information on this. It's just one of those things because it's so hard one paper came and after that everyone just gave up because you know who was going to go ahead and dig some more thankfully we had clayton and kevin you know who were willing and other students who they do it even without the uh, offer for pizza so they must really love roots as well so this is you know time series to show in you know, different uh, growth stages uh, in the nodulation from the same genotype the final uh, student uh, research i want to show is uh, kevin and Kevin's, uh, again, one of the things that uh, we don't know about these root traits. So soybean has a very narrow genetic pool in the commercial germplasm. And we know very little about root variability, traits, you know, different root traits. So Kevin's taken, um, you know, this galaxy of genotypes that exist in the USDA gene bank. He's uh, sampled from the mini core collection to make sure that the integrity of the sample is remaining, but at a smaller scale. And just using PCA, these are the different countries that different uh, clusters are predominantly from and the kind of variability that exists. What he's doing with this is, and again, the video didn't play. Um, what he's doing with this is, again, he had to come up with an imaging solution. So he uh, came up with this platform. Uh, it required several iterations, but you know, I think he has finally nailed it. And then using uh, different approaches, again, using some of the machine learning for segmentation to get the root trait. Uh, this is in control condition. This is a time series. So he's, uh, he's about 500,000 data points. Uh, the combination of 300 genotypes, 14 replications, and three time, three time points that he's studying. And then uh, using uh, computer vision methodologies to come up with you know, information on you know, explaining how what root diversity exists. So how can we improve something if we don't even know what exists in our repertoire you know, as a geneticist? So this is you know, shedding light on that information. But you know, greenhouse is a greenhouse and field is field. So this is um, in the field. Oh, didn't play very well either. There are two videos here. So 
using this information from the field and then uh, phenotyping it in the booth to be able to come up with, you know, both from the greenhouse and from the field to try and link them together. Getting all of those traits, we're talking about 30 plus traits, not just that biomass that I was talking about the root limb, but a lot more traits. Ultimately coming to this stage where we know exactly what's happening here, what diversity we, ex we have to play with, what's happening below ground, what diversity we have, and how do we fuse them together to fill in the true phenomic cube. If we can fill in that true phenomic cube, then some of those difficult to phenotype traits, some of the you know, inductive reasoning about you know, deciphering, observing some of those patterns and coming up with new theories or you know, new rules, that can only happen you know, with some of these approaches. I'll skip this. This is just uh, the loop of how the breeding program is set up with the phenotyping and all you know, this different aspects of digital uh, breeding and some of the questions we're doing leading to new variety. This year, we finally have some new varieties, and then we keep following the loop. I'll finish with these points from my learning. First one is that I've learned that if, if we ask, or someone asks me to you know, solve some of their problem, I would encourage them to keep contacting me because I will take it in the direction that I see. If they don't come and have a continuous loop, it can derail very, very rapidly. So I've learned, so my human learning about ML and phenotyping is you got to have a very continuous loop of interaction to make sure that, you know, all collaborating people are on the same page. Collaborations, they're enabling us to target the hard to study traits. And, you know, I've tried to give you some examples of them. We know the the technology will always become cheaper and more readily available. We're gonna have more and more sensors, more sophisticated sensors. We can get information that we did not have previously. With platforms, we just think of drones, but you know, robots, there's so many more innovations that are happening. Digital phenotyping is gonna become the norm. And machine learning or deep learning approaches, when you have that kind of data, traditional linear statistics is not gonna do the job. It's just not. So we gotta start thinking that how do we you know, continue riding this revolution, uh, technology revolution, to be able to get the information that we need. And predictions are great, don't get me wrong. As a breeder, sometimes I don't really care what is happening with the why, because I wear the breeder hat more than the researcher hat. But thanks to my students and my colleagues, they sometimes remind me, okay, you know, but do you really know why? And I'm like, I don't know. So predictions are great, but I would encourage and myself and hopefully some of you may agree with me that we need to study mechanisms as well. And no one approach can solve everything. I'm going to thank all the funding agencies and, again, my three collaborators and a bunch of other collaborators that I have in their groups. Thank you for your attention.